Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming today. Thanks also to the organizers who made this event possible. I would like to start with an anecdote. A few years ago, for a Halloween party, everyone had to dress up as their biggest fear. Well, I dressed up as a deadline. I borrowed all of my friends' watches that I stacked along my arm. I had this giant countdown t-shirt. I was also wearing shorts as a nod to always being short on time. Everyone probably thought that the costume was just about every grad student's worst fear. And I can't deny the fact that I myself do dread academic deadlines. But what they couldn't see was the other deadline, the ultimate deadline, the one that bears a sense of impending doom that we all share in the 21st century, the ecological deadline that has been imposed on the Earth. Even if we finally seem to acknowledge the irreversible harm being done to the planet and share the same sense of urgency, the truth is that we are past the deadline. As many have remarked, including French philosopher Bruno Latour, we can no longer claim to be living in the era of an ecological crisis. Latour opens up this very book by an observation that I'm sure everyone in this room will relate to, an observation about how our daily existence is saturated with reminders about climate change. It doesn't stop, he writes. Every morning, it begins all over again. One day, it's rising water levels. The next, it's soil erosion. By evening, it's the glaciers melting faster and faster. On the 8 p.m. news, we learn that thousands of species are about to disappear, etc. In my research, I do not seek to determine when it all started and when it stopped qualifying as a crisis. Instead, I'm, in, I'm interested in how, in the 19th century, the word limit started to mean something that was ecological. To do that, I situate my research at a nexus between science and literature. I look at the way 19th century scientific discoveries may have led to a dawning consciousness about a countdown regarding the Earth and its resources. For example, thermodynamics predicted that the, th that the sun would run out of energy and cause what is called the heat death of the universe. In my dissertation, I studied the way these new anxieties permeated fiction, in particular science fiction. So far, I've only talked about time limits, but I also study limits in space, geographical limits. The 19th century, perhaps more than any other century, was obsessed with the idea of finishing what had been started but never completed, mapping out the entire globe so that there were no more blank spaces. As a result, the 19th century really became the golden age of polar exploration, both in the Arctic and the Antarctic with dozens of expeditions trying to determine what was at the far ends of the Earth. And I'm always fascinated by the journal logs from such expeditions that I find buried in the archives. And I'm not the only one. The popular imagination back then was really fond of rescue missions following the mysterious disappearance of ships like that of the Franklin expedition. John Franklin, not, you know, Ben. <laughs> the ends of the Earth that I study are geographical, geological, and ecological. What I want to show you today is how one French novelist, sometimes called the father of science fiction, had the same idea. His name was Jules Verne. You might know him from novels such as 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea or Around the World in 80 Days. His whole project was characterized by an overlapping of scientific, spatial, and temporal quests. As his editor wrote, 
Verne's aim is to sum up all the geographic, geological, physical, and astronomical knowledge accumulated by modern science, and hence to rewrite in the attractive and picturesque form, which is his specialty, the history of the universe. Rereading his novels at the end of the earth, I realized that really going to the last limits of the globe for him was haunted by elements that are so familiar to us and have become a part of our climate crisis. This is a map from one of Verne's novels in the Arctic, in which the goal of the expedition is to reach the North Pole. What strikes me in this novel is the manic obsession of the captain to keep thrusting forward, to keep pushing the limits, while at the same time, the novel is haunted by the depletion of resources like coal and even food for the surviving crew members. Verne also explores the South Pole in a novel called An Antarctic Mystery. It's a novel that really straddles the line between different sorts of limits, between texts, between fiction and reality, and that gives the boundary between the known and the unknown a mystical dimension. All this in a way that is very much anchored in an ever-changing landscape. As a side note, if you're wondering why there is water, a sound splitting the pole in two, it's because back then some scientists argued that there was a warm sea at the South Pole. That said, Verne was fascinated by all sorts of geographical ends of the Earth, not just the poles. In my dissertation, I follow his itinerary to spatial boundaries of all sorts. For example, I, I look at the center of the Earth as a limit, unless this time the limit is not on a horizontal plane, but a vertical one. The particularity of going to the center of the Earth is that the deeper you go in terms of depth, the farther you go back in terms of time, back to the very birth of the planet, millions of, millions of years ago, and the geological traces that it left, thus shattering the, comfort, the comforting idea of a young planet controlled by humanity. I also look beyond the limits of the atmosphere. And of course, back in the 19th century, space was still the real unexplored margin. So I look at how science fiction grappled with this type of scaling up and adopted the global planetary scale of concern that resonates with 20th century thinking about the planet's fragility. So what's the point of looking at science fiction at the most remote strips of the known world? One of my guiding interrogation is the extent to which literature can be a means of thinking about finitude. And if it is, why and how it is the genre of science fiction that may have managed to bring concerns of an endangered planet into view by infusing the notion of limit with a new meaning that may have precluded our own anxieties about ecological limitedness, about the fact that there is an ecological countdown. Thank you.